Okay, so in this video, we're going to talk about mutations. Now, one of the things I've noticed about mutations is that when we say that word, we tend to think about like negative consequences. But in reality, the majority of mutations are neutral and they are responsible <clears throat> for the huge diversity of genes found among organisms. When we look at like human eye color, for example, blue eyes is due to a mutation that occurred 6,000 years ago. So when we think about uh, mutations, we basically have two categories. You have your small scale DNA mutations, as well as your large scale chromosomal mutations. Uh, what we're going to focus on in this video are these small scale uh, point mutations that happen during DNA replication. So let's take this double strand of DNA and let's see what happens if we were to go through S phase and have this strand replicate, right? So like here, if we open up, this isn't really how it happens, right? But if we um, like unwind the double helix and we have a new strands being built, like here we see it being built from five to three. So here's maybe like the leading strand or something or the lagging, whatever. Um, but in the other strand, let's say that DNA polymerase three uh, makes a mistake. And right here, instead of adding an A, it adds a C. So it's an incorrect uh, base pair. So when we call these types of mutations uh, point mutations, it's because it happens at a single point. Now, they're also known as substitution mutations because this, like the A, was substituted for a C. So with this, um, if we think about the whole point of DNA replication is to make identical daughter cells, well, like this would end up, this uh, chromosome would end up in cell number one, and this would end up in cell number two, made by mitosis. So in actuality, they wouldn't be identical daughter cells, but only one of the cells would actually have the mutation. But anyway, so let's go ahead and see the significance of this. So now let's pretend that uh, these two genes, let's say that the mutation happened in a gene, um, and now this gene is going to be transcribed. So here RNA polymerase does transcription on both of these template strands. And you can see how originally um, the RNA should have a U right here, but instead the RNA has a G. So this is kind of significant if you think about um, when we read our messenger RNA in the process of translation. When we divide the mRNA into codons, um, that point mutation changes the codon. So originally, it was like a, a codon that coded for serine amino acid, and now that mutation um, is coding for alanine. So that primary structure, that, that primary sequence of amino acids in the polypeptide is now different. And this can be significant depending on the chemical properties of the R groups and how it influences how that protein folds. So when we look at point mutations, there are a couple different kinds. So um, we're gonna use this AGC as our original DNA, and then our original codon is UCG that codes for serine amino acid. So in a, some types of point mutations, um, let's say that this third base uh, mutates in the DNA. Instead of uh, DNA polymerase 3 adding a C, a cytosine, it adds adenine or an A. Well, that will change the codon. But guess what? Because of the redundancy of the genetic code, it still codes for Siri. So over here, we can see how UCG right here codes for serine, but so does UCU. It's kind of cool. When there's mutations in that third base, you can kind of see, like, look at proline. There are four different codons that all code for proline or leucine. So that's kind of nice that that third base sometimes, it's not always disastrous to have a mutation. Sometimes it could have no impact 
and we call that a silent mutation. The amino acid didn't change. However, sometimes um, we could have what's called a missense mutation. And in a missense mutation, uh, the codon, the new codon, does code for a different amino acid. And so this could have, here, let me move this right here. This could have um, a significant or have a significant impact on how the protein folds depending on the properties of the R groups. So let's pretend the original amino acid was polar. And in this missense mutation, the new amino acid is also polar. Well, it shouldn't have too much of an impact on how the protein folds up. However, if you have a polar replaced with a nonpolar amino acid, well, now that will cause the protein to fold up differently. And if you remember, shape determines function. So if we change the shape of the protein, we potentially change the function. And that could be bad, could be good, might end up as neutral. It all depends on the situation. Okay, and then we have <clears throat> a nonsense mutation. Now these are pretty, can be pretty disastrous. In a nonsense mutation, it is still just one nucleotide being switched out or being substituted in that one point, but the resulting new codon is a stop codon. Now this is bad because then when you have the ribosome translating the mRNA, when it gets to a stop codon, it stops. So you may end up with a like a protein that's not finished being built, and you end up with like a non-functional protein. So like here, if you have like a mistake like this, and then you have your um, like a point mutation, well now as you divide this up, you have a stop codon here. So then as the ribosome builds the polypeptide, it gets to a stop, and now that polypeptide is not finished. Now, it's possible if, like, a protein is a 1,000 amino acids long and the stop codon is near the end, well, and it's like 995 amino acids, well, maybe it'll fold up just fine and maybe still work somewhat. But if you have your stop codon happen early in the um, in the like mRNA, well, then that could be pretty disastrous, and that organism would be missing a protein. Okay, so let's go ahead though and look at our other kinds of um, DNA mutations. These ones are called frame shift. I want you to think about it as like we're shifting the whole reading frame, like how you divide the um, mRNA into codons is shifted. So basically, in frame shift mutations, you have either insertions where you add or you have deletions. So let's look at our original strand of DNA and mRNA here. Okay, so we can divide it into codons and then you get your polypeptide. Now, in a deletion or an insertion, oops, this is where I want you to focus like down here in this area. So what's gonna happen in an insertion or a deletion is um, some of the nucleotides are not added. They're like deleted from the sequence. So here, oops, let me move this for you. Let's move it up top. So now this strand of DNA that we're gonna use to make the RNA is a little bit shorter. There were some nucleotides that were deleted. So now our strand of RNA will also be different. So now when we divide it by codons, um, well basically we had that like mutation happen somewhere in this area. So initially, like, sorry, that stop should have shown up later, but um, here like MET was still the same. Everything leading up to where the deletion happened will be the same. It's after the deletion, our codons, so you can see in the top here, it should have been AUC, but now what we have, it, it should be AUC, CGA, but basically this C, um, yeah, this C uh, was deleted and this U, because right now you can see like we are, this 
G and C from this next codon are now here. So it's basically been shifted over because we deleted that U and C. So now this is called a frame shift. The reading frame, like how we read it, has all been shifted to the left. And so now when we divide our codons, they're going to code for different amino acids. Now, what I showed here was called a deletion mutation, but you could very likely um, have also an insertion where we add nucleotides. And then likewise, you would that would be like if you cut in line, you know, like you add some people to the line, everyone shifts down. Uh, the same logic, your how you divide those codons um, would be different, like how you read them would code for different amino acids. Okay, so those are frame shift mutations and those have a bigger impact than the point mutations because literally anywhere after the insertion or deletion is gonna have a different sequence of amino acids. And here you can see it actually ended up coding for a stop codon as we shifted. So this like UGA, which wasn't a stop codon up here, is now a stop codon. Because remember, we had two being deleted. Okay, so let's go ahead and look here. Well, what happens though, if you have a frame shift or even a point mutation that happens in the intron region of a gene, right? So like if I have this DNA strand here, and this DNA strand, um, I just color coded, the introns to be like the red regions, and then um, the black represents the exons or the coding regions of this gene. So if we were to transcribe and make the messenger RNA, you can see how the introns are gonna be removed, and now this black RNA right here represents all of the exons being expressed. And then you would divide this into codons and um, have a polypeptide. However, if you have like an insertion or a deletion or a point mutation happen um, in an intron. So let's say like right here, I just had to be deleted. So we had a deletion here. And a lot of times students are like, oh no, well, it's gonna shift the whole reading frame and all of the um, amino acids and the polypeptide will be different. But will it? Let's think. So right here now, we have this intron, so if I compare this intron to up here, like that's where the deletion happened. But really guys, pause the video and study the exons. The exons that are the part that are expressed and like kept are still the same. So even though it was a whole like deletion in an intron, it's gonna be okay because, oh, and even check this out. It just so happened that this, this is a stop codon. So if you have a stop codon even, it's okay because it's gonna be removed. And as it's removed and the exons are spliced together, now you can pause the video if you'd like and compare, but these two mRNAs are exactly the same. So when we talk about mutations, in order for a mutation to really have an impact on a phenotype, or on the physical expression of traits or of genes, it actually has to happen in a coding region of your DNA. So in our DNA, only 1% of our DNA codes for genes. And in those genes, we have regions that are introns, that are non-coding. So like literally, when we talk about mutations, most of them are neutral. Uh, every time your cells divide, you get about 30 new mutations and errors. However, they're happening in non-coding regions, so they're not having an impact on our phenotypes. A mutation has to happen in an exon part that will be expressed to actually manifest or show up in that organism. Now, I don't have a slide for this, but the other thing I should point out is that for a mutation to be passed from parents to offspring, um, it actually has to happen in a sperm or in an egg. So if I had a mutation happen in my skin cell that leads to skin cancer and then I get pregnant, 
my baby won't have skin cancer because the mutation was not in my egg. So um, like mutations to inherit would have to occur um, in the process basically of meiosis. When making sperm or egg, a mutation happens and then that mutation would end up in the offspring. Okay, so that is my discussion on small scale, uh, like point mutations, substitution mutations, and frame shift mutations. All right, good job.